fourth day of uh, this flight form uh, at the China Real East. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, we are virtual reality um, make show by. Um, and uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Sandra Medvedskaya uh, of Cora Contemporary. Uh, we are a production company based in Zurich. Nina Roers of uh, Roers Birch Gallery, also based in Zurich. And uh, Jakob Hutzensen, artist and uh, art director. And he also runs a studio, uh, like also a kind of production company. Uh, it's uh, uh, called Erratic Animism. Okay. Okay, so my name is Jacob, and um, I think we're all going to present our work a little bit first to give you guys some context of what we're doing and how we work. So, generally speaking, I build immersive kind of installation landscapes, and they're all based on real world uh, places that I go to and embed myself in a landscape sometimes for a month at a time or two months. And then I collect textures, audio, different materials, and then resample that together digitally to build these kind of new worlds, and uh, each world has some different Themes like the piece is uh, extinction, so it's all based on an extinct bird and audio recording of the last time it was observed in '87. So uh, the whole project is based on audio recordings of this bird's mating call. Um, and this is an example of an installation. This is for the Venice Biennial, where yeah, there are four different VR computers and then these two uh, LED screens, so they can work also in full daylight of, uh, opposite each other. So usually all my exhibitions. Uh, I never show, I rarely show the work just as the art, for example. It's usually integrated into a larger installation or something so people kind of feel welcome, but they get a sense of what they're about to enter in the headset. And I also uh, tile or kind of connect together video elements and the VR elements. So it's not like I show what's in the VR headset on the screens. It's more a connection of it or an extension of the piece that has some narrative maybe, and then the VR often is more sensory. Um, and also for these exhibitions, I often digitize the full exhibition space. So these video screens that show this ecosystem that this bird used to live on, they journey through a virtual replication of the entire exhibition space that's then on top of this island. Uh, so I merged together the space you're in with the virtual spaces also before the headset and after the, the headset. So, can you just click? Oh, that's the wrong one. Next, just go next. Yeah. One more. Okay, so that's the opposite side of that space. So you kind of call it between these two screens. So I, I usually also build an immersive space around the VR. Uh, this is another example. So this is the same piece, but each time I show the pieces, I try to contextualize them to the specific exhibition space and their kind of architectural properties. So this is in the Picture Art Center in Kiev, which was quite a, just like a white cube boring space. So there did the opposite where in Venice it was like, the installation is minimal. Here it's the opposite where it's like the, the, the ceiling and the walls are painted the two characteristic colors of this bird that the piece is about. And then also I use in my, almost all my pieces kind of soil of different things that gives texture under your feet, but also smell. So of course you can't see that here, but that's like a strong wood smell inside the exhibition space. And I also sometimes connect these virtual and physical elements. So there's like a bug zapper in this video because this bird became extinct because of avian malaria. And then there's a physical bug zapper in the space too that kind of buzzes once in a while. So it's kind of connected to the virtual space, this interactive element outside. Um, yeah, this is uh, soil. And uh, yeah, so I also built these computers for shows. So this one, for example, has this high reflective glass, so it almost becomes a mirror and reflecting the screens. Um, it's just some small items to contextualize what's in the headset. Uh, yeah, then in the VR piece itself, you're kind of in this habitat where this bird used to live, and it's based on memories of a an ornithologist Douglas and his story of encountering this bird. Just next. Yeah, then usually also I build entire ecosystems, so this VR piece is an entire island replicated uh, from like satellite images, so it's a one-to-one -one replica and it's these, all these mountains are actually there. Um, yeah, then in this piece, for example, it starts with that actual story of this 
burn and this landscape and these materials that I collected, but then it morphs into this completely other world, reanimated uh, creature brought back to life, kind of more poetic and artistic. Um, yeah, I can play this final video. So this is the main hall. Hello, um, uh, I'm Nino, Nino Roas from Roas Research Gallery in Zurich. Um, we are a gallery that started in 2016 and um, due to all the things happening to us in society in the context of the digitalization, we took the decision to say that we would mainly work with artists who are in their works kind of focusing on digitalization and what it means to society. And um, usually that's not specifically related to one media or excluding any media. But somehow, through the works of our artists, we came across a lot of, of course, digital or new media related works. And we found that there are so many works that are not being able to be shown in the gallery because somehow they're coming out of the digital realm. They're sitting in their computers, and even though from time to time they are trying to bring them into our gallery by printing them or by 3D printing, somehow they become 2D and usually they lose part of their character. And that Amongst some VR works we fell in love with of some of our artists made us think about virtual reality as one opportunity maybe to overcome of some of these problems and kind of to bring, create a gate where people could be together with these works like in a, in a physical space, they could, in a virtual reality space, they could see them like in a gallery. And that's why we, um, in uh, January this year we launched our virtual gallery, it's called Cube, it's a virtual gallery for virtual art really for art that's not being virtualized, but for art that's native virtual, as we call it. And this is a building that you see. The architecture is by Manuel Rosner. It's a young German artist who often works in his virtual reality works with space and, and integrating his art into spaces or the spaces into his virtual reality art. So it's always going back and forth between the digital and the physical. And um, together, we, for one year, we worked on this and we created a building structure that's somewhere in the sky. We didn't define where it sits because we didn't want to feel it's necessary. You can enter this when you come to the gallery or wherever we have to fight on the computer with the HTC Vive. And then you can walk around with a controller, self-control in the five cubicle rooms. And, um, Yeah, that's the way actually we set it up when we launched it just here in January. We put a bit like Jacob also said, somewhere you need a context for VR and we set the computer quite dominantly in our gallery on a pedestal. We projected the content that people would see through the glasses to walls so that everybody could participate. And we also presented some images of the works and some information in the gallery next with it. Um, and this is actually one of the rooms. I mean, now it's, it's not moving. This is a work also by Manuel Rosner. And for the first exhibition, we invited five artists, each to work with one of the rooms. You can see they are very much like a white cube, typical gallery room. And that's intentional. We did not really want people to overly focus on being in a, in a virtual environment. We wanted them really kind of to be in there 
and look at virtual art as if they would be in a, in a gallery space and they'd be together. This works in one room. Um, yeah, this is for example. Ah, now we are jump one side, doesn't matter. Um, this is actually the trailer that we just did where you will see all the five rooms and the five artworks. And uh, this is by Martina Menebaum, for example. And we really see Cube as a, as a, our second gallery room and we also aim to create several shows in it. We just did this first show on sculpture this year. This is Theo Tlantafilidis, whose org is building a sculpture. This is Chiara Passa. This is now kind of a view through the windows from the outside. Yeah, and that's back basically how we kind of started focusing more on VR next to our regular shows at the gallery and we're more and more also showing um, individual or like, like let's say closed environment works by, by virtual reality artists or artists who work with virtual reality. We just showed um, Melody Mosse and at the moment we're showing Mark Lee and we're kind of doing this next to our or as one focus of our gallery program because somehow we believe virtual reality is very interesting um, from two aspects. One is like it's an interesting new media for artists and the other reason for us is it also gives opportunities to show things as otherwise would not be shown or maybe in general to question how we're going to present and consume art in the future. Hi, my name is Sandra Jedwiecka. I'm um, from Core Contemporary. We are a production company based uh, in Copenhagen, in London and Zurich. Um, that produce artworks in virtual reality with artists. So we um, we founded the company in 2016. It seems to be the the big outset of VR art, um, and launched with a work that we produced with Paul McCarthy in Venice two years ago. Um, and our main aim was to be able to give artists all the tools to to use VR as a new medium because. It, I think today, when you look at art, there is very little avant-garde. I mean, and virtual reality is that new medium that artists can explore. And so um, we found a core of contemporary with that aim. And actually, we have been working so far mostly with artists that have never worked in uh, virtual reality. Um, and of course, during the whole process, the artist is central. So um, our team sitting in Copenhagen goes to the artist's studio, for the Paul's, for example, in LA, um, and is constantly in touch with the artist, and the artist is in charge of the creative process, but we give them all the opportunities to, to create in, in VR. And we've done se about seven works so far with different artists, and each one of them is extremely different, because uh, the idea is that um, you see the artist's footprint, and the virtual reality work fits into the greater oeuvre of the artist. So, you know, our aim and our hope is that VR is not uh, set apart as a different medium, but it's actually part of, you know, the, the body of um, work of an artist in general. So, we'll just maybe show you a little video about us and the artists we've worked in with. The main reason for founding Core Contemporary was to give the artist the opportunity to see what they could create in virtual reality, to, to challenge this new media. Is, is, is such an interesting way of working with this new medium to really like um, make something that has never existed before.
think our first word is passion. Uh, we have a close relationship with the artists. We really would like to be that bridge that transfers their vision into VR. The idea for the artworks is always from the artists and what's interesting for us is to find out how to translate that with the technology that's available today in the best way possible to bring their vision to life within this new medium. face to face with this unexpected artistic raw reality. I think the big dream for us would be that uh, there is no such distinction as art and VR art. It would be great to come into a museum or into an exhibition and just see it as another oeuvre in, in the artist's uh, body of work. So in the future core contemporary, what I really hope is that we will uh, continue working with, with uh, groundbreaking artists. For now, we have only seen a fraction of what can be done. There are always obvious reasons to talk about new technologies uh, for the simple fact that they are new. Um, however, if you look at the fate of what was once called media art, it's a sad fate uh, to a certain extent. Uh, we did a kind of uh, 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 archaeology of net art uh, uh, two years ago on the level of our print magazine. Uh, you could also say that net art had a kind of uh, sad fate. Uh, I hope uh, Nina is going to uh, contradict me because uh, you represent at least uh, two artists, that are, uh, artist groups that are uh, considered to be uh, very important net art artists, like uh, uh, art that worked with internet technology um, started more than 20 years ago. Um, and it's obvious, and also net art is a good case, because there was a uh, utopianism, which also had a kind of destructive side associated with it, um, to kind of change the art world. Um, and uh, my first question would be, do you see any real, that is, structural changes in art production, uh, like at least on the horizon uh, of uh, we are, uh, like uh, virtual or also augmented uh, Reality. So when I talk about VR, it's also all, uh, in, uh, always talk about VR and uh, AR. Um, one uh, uh, like line of development seems to me at least likely, we, we also have seen it now, that VR production becomes corporate. That happened, for instance, to film. So now we have a film industry that is basically part of the entertainment industry. And then you have auteur films still. And this kind of division, uh, maybe it's going to be different in, in five or ten years, still structured the world of film, or still is, is structured the world of film. So that's why do you see any structural changes in art production? It's 
sometimes I feel at the moment at least there are kind of two worlds when you look at virtual reality. Uh, there's this kind of breed of artists who always work with their computer or maybe study art and then turn to their computer to create art, who create their or program their own virtual reality works. And then of course there is let's say Acute and Cobra, the two I think best known companies or studios helping supporting artists who did not necessarily work with the media before, supporting them in kind of embed this new technology in their overall artistic practice. Um, I think virtual reality is quite complicated, but also costs a lot of money. I mean, when people look at it, they always feel like, oh, that's easily done, that can be shown anywhere, that can be copied. So kind of that's, that's nothing. But I think it's the opposite. To do a painting might be, compared to that, might be much easier and you're much more in self-control of a lot of artists are. I mean, I think Jack Hooper also to talk a bit about how many people are kind of contributing to his works to make them great works in, in total. And, and um, I feel one thing that's interesting might be augmented reality because that's something at least that you can place everywhere. So I mean, as an artist, when you come up with a good augmented reality work, just place it in any museum or at any fair, you could basically hack art Basel and just do your own show. Something that happened already to the MoMA. So maybe that's a change in the future that might happen to the art I mean, market. This is a very technical question now. Of course, all legal issues, uh, uh, not even like, they haven't been asked, uh, well, they are, they are about to be uh, asked right now because uh, make a virtual replica of MoMA, who owns the image of MoMA? Oh, MoMA. I don't, you don't necessarily need to make a replica, I mean more to go to the MoMA and by, for example, geo-tracking or by taking an image as a trigger, yeah. just put your own work somewhere at the MoMA and do your own party. <laughs> yeah, it can be a, well, it can be a pop-up group exhibition in a museum. Uh, yeah, so for structural changes, so my background is in art, but I've also been using video game technology since a teenager, so a lot of my friends in the community, the people that I work with and talk with for inspiration and everything, are really in between many fields of like film, art, music, performance, um, and video games, and like these, the way I see it is that the borders between these fields, with VR especially, has to be made. So like now we have the art world that starts to do more VR, but the film world really jumped on it at Sundance and these film festivals way before that. Um, and then it was a lot of agencies especially that came in and then did some interesting productions and things. But what I find interesting about VR in terms of stru like structurally speaking, are these new forms of collaboration. So like right now I'm working with a guy, he makes audio installations and museum, uh, museums of natural history. And then he's making audio for like a, phone app and because um, for that app then you get then all of a sudden he gets greater kind of creative um, possibility because it's in, in an art context. So the way I look at it when I think about VR for example is more structurally where the work I show I, I make two also tours in film festivals. Some of it is available online so it also participates in a community that where for people who know nothing about what's in contemporary art for example. So to me it's it's interesting how the, the different fields are kind of um, or the people who create it move in between fields and it requires expertise for many different fields to realize it really well like um, like a performer for example you know like if you showed you work with motion capture so motion capture has been existing in video games for 20 years to, to animate characters and so that you need a performer for example well, I think one doesn't exclude the other I think there is no fixed structure yet I think VI is still such a nascent technology and I think, for example, of course, you know, we as Cora, you know, or Acute, we would work with, with artists who haven't used VR, but they want to explore it, and they, they need, um, you know, the know-how, they need uh, somebody with access to this technology to make things happen. And I think it also depends what, what you would like to achieve, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a certain experience, or whether it's an artist experimenting with VR, or whether an artist, an artist comes to us, for example, we come to them and propose to create an artwork in virtual reality. So I think it's it's still there's so much, as you said, there's, there's no clear border, there's so much movement from one to the other. And in essence, I think today what we have to do is to get together, you know, the galleries, the artists, the production companies like us, and collaborate. Yeah, I definitely think so because also when you look at the more commercial side of it, like things in VR that has been published for people online, for people to download, that has become 
more and more kind of uh, corporate, um, and it's a few big studios that do it more and more. And it started like three years ago, so there were a few studios that then produced most of the like experimental VR, which was in film festivals. And then that's kind of been accelerating, so there are a few of those studios now, but bigger ones. Uh, so it's definitely becoming more like a net, like outside of. I mean, I see it. I also think when we make VR, we are participating in the cultural production of it. So it's also in conversation with what other fields are making. So when I make VR, I also see it in relation to what someone might be making outside the museum as well. And there, it's definitely becoming more like a Netflix kind of thing, um, quite progressively. would say that the nature of collaboration uh, on the level of VR is kind of necessarily different from a classic workshop scenario uh, with a master and assistant, which reflects pretty well contemporary uh, uh, corporate structure, which, which is rather flat, non-hierarchical. Uh, you have to combine uh, different uh, skill sets, uh, some, something like this. Yeah, at least for my work, that's the way I work. So the audio visualization of the bird, that's something I made with a guy in the Thomas. So he's, he also made all the visuals of York, for example. So like I collaborate with people who are really head of the things they do creatively outside the art world as well, because these are the people that I actually talk to as an artist and, and hang out with and everything. And then I want to do more and more, where it's kind of uh, better ways of production of building these new worlds. Um, with people who are really head of what they do instead of trying to hire, you know, it's like if I want audio in my piece, I'd rather work with someone who's just an extreme expert at it and really wants to explore something in it in a new way uh, rather than kind of cold, um, like, a, for example, like my, my studio, Running Animals, we also start to enable productions outside of the Apple, so we're doing something in a music festival, like an extinction field with 40 speakers out in the field that plays audio from extinct animals. Um, and the guy producing that, he's, it's just kind of my concept, but there's another guy who gets all the, he's kind of the lead artist on it and everything, so by having a studio doing it, he can kind of explore some of his passion for it without it being me as an artist necessarily. Um, so that's kind of the direction that I see things moving for myself at least. Um, Sandra, how many people uh, have worked with Paul McCarthy's uh, uh, piece uh, that you can also see at the limit that it's pictured here on the, Small screen. Well, we have a team of about 11, around 11 people sitting in Copenhagen, and it's more not about how many people, but it's the hours. Oh, the hours, yes. yes. I would say it's about, it was about a thousand hours altogether. So, this is also going back to what you said, and it's costly, it's, uh, it's very laborious, and for example, you know, because we would like and want the artist to be constantly in control of the process, and until the artist is absolutely satisfied, which for example, in Paul's, you know, there's an anecdote. About how we did the work with him, you know, we went to the studio in LA and then his idea was to film these two uh, actresses in a motion capture suit because it's from the stagecoach series. Um, and these are the characters that appear in this uh, very uh, controversial film about uh, Donald Trump as well. So, you know, and then we filmed so much footage and we came back with an with a, with a almost finished artwork to, to Paul and then. He saw it and he completely changed it. So you know, he then went in and you know did all his cuts, and then he actually wanted to use all the footage. So we ended up with eleven versions of this one artwork. But you know, so he was totally in control, and we had to take as much time as was needed. So if there's another hundred hours that needs to be spent on that piece, we do it because obviously we invest ourselves and our time into producing uh, a final piece for the artist. Um, when it comes to Show, I don't, once a piece is produced, uh, when it comes to showing, uh, I'm not an expert on uh, VR, as you probably have uh, guessed, um, but I, I can, uh, at least in my, my opinion, I can see two main strategies of showing uh, 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 VR work. Um, uh, McCarthy's uh, work at uh, um, Unlimited is one example, I call it uh, uh, VR modernism. So you exhibit the technical uh, apparatus, uh, or like Nina explained before, you have the, the, the uh, uh, computer uh, uh, which is actually processing uh, uh, the, the VR work 
right in the center of the space. Or another example, like the, the other strategy uh, we also had in the Jakob's show presentation, is to double the immersion. Because VR is basically an uh, immersive uh, uh, experience. So you dive in, you, uh, at least if it's working. Um, and of course, because of a, a general uh, kind of, um, uh, how do you say it in English? Um, Performativity is one of the kind of main cultural characteristics of our time. So you have to, these people queuing, um, you have these nice uh, pedestals, the, the assistants helping people uh, 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 coming to, to managing with the, with the technical stuff and so on. Uh, and you see people, of course, moving. And this is a kind of choreography. That's, uh, I'm sure that Paul McCarthy is very conscious about. So this is kind of this, uh, 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 this other aspect. Uh, so this kind of choreography, uh, we are modernism and this uh, doubling of uh, immersion with the okay, floor, the smell and so on. I mean, smell can't yet, to my knowledge, not be reproduced. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of a few years. How do you see the, like, this kind of the, the issue getting VR into a real space. When, when we created when we created Q, we thought about it for a long time. First we thought about like hiding the computer like you did now at the fair you only showed the glasses, the necessary part that you cannot really hide. And then we thought maybe it's interesting for people to, to see that it comes out of this machine because when people have virtual they always go like, oh it's online. So online digital workshops, it's all like being mixed up and we really wanted people to see you know, actually there's a graphic card working a file very hard with every turn you to make with your, with your head and that's where it comes from because that's also something at the moment um, a lot of people say, oh I have to come to the gallery when I want to see a virtual reality gallery. Yeah, somewhat sounds a bit absurd but at the same time I mean, we're making something accessible that's completely new and we could of course send people the file who have the right technical infrastructure but for example we couldn't just make it available online and then there are also things like copyrights and other questions that would need to be looked at and um, we really felt uh, or what we experienced we were quite nervous when we put the computer up there and invited people to the first opening we had like two computers and two, two sets of glasses kind of to make sure that people would get the opportunity to go in there at the opening but we experienced through the fact that we um, beamed it or um, projected it on the wall that a lot of people who never did VR up until that night, that they really felt invited by watching the others having the glasses on, looking at the wall projection, and they started talking to each other. And um, it was a really very social, social evening, and the people being a bit more shy, they could be more behind the wall, so not really the center of attention. And, um, what we also noticed whenever people came to the gallery in the following weeks, that they really talk to you or you talk to them because they somehow they need you. They need some existence um, in order to find out how to use this um, device, a lot of them, and then also kind of to go through all of the rooms and kind of have a good experience. So we had much more conversations than we usually have in a show when they come in and just tour through the gallery even though you offered to answer to some questions. So I don't know, I think, but I also with Jacob, when it comes to this immersion, I think the more you can do to make, make people feel what they feel in, their, in the room and the more protected they feel by the setup you choose, I think the better. But it also depends on the work. Yeah, I mean, for me, for example, um, I, you know, I make a lot of considerations why show we are in Arbol, for example. But to me, the really interesting thing is exactly that's a long history of making physical spaces and doing all sorts of crazy stuff there. Like, I mean, that's art that's way more, way more wild and experimental than VR, for example. You know, crazy performances and everything. So to me, it's just interesting that there's a space in society that can handle, you know, large audiences. And it's a space that has a culture of introducing them to some new experiences. So that's my, that's really just the basics of my approach to it. So, Every installation will be different. Like I've also done completely minimal white space installations because the exhibition space was just super interesting. That was enough just to think about where you position the headset, and that was kind of enough to create a compelling 
uh, installation. So to me, it's just really always contextual and changes with the space itself, how you're showing it. To me, there's no golden rule for it or something. It also depends on the piece itself. Does it fit the concept? The theme of it, is it meaningful to show the computer for a specific piece or not? Um, is there a soil around that you're supposed to I mean, sorry to interrupt. What would yeah. be the criteria for you? Does that the audience uh, feel welcome to the space and it's they're able to just walk in and really feel like kind of curious as a physical space and that's something in that VR they they feel like they're they're approaching something. That's that's my criteria. I make it for the audience to experience the work. And actually, you know, I actually more people that experience my work physically than online. Because if you put stuff online, it's, it's, it, you know, it's also almost utopian to think that just because you put a work online, then you have an audience. Because once you do that, you're competing with a twenty million dollar productions, and their advertising value exceeds your entire, you know, crew. And that is what the audience will look at. It also depends on how you think about audience and who it is. But for me, it's just like. It's, it's things made in VR mixed with other things made in VR. And just, that's kind of my approach to it. So it has to be able to survive and be interesting mixed to other things made in other fields in VR as well. It's very interesting. I think it depends on the approach because we are, for example, interested in the process. And when we shown our pieces in the past, I mean, as you saw in the video, every artist who worked in works in a different medium. So, you know, Paul has sculpture and film and um, you know, all sorts of different uh, media that he works in. Yu Hong, the Chinese artist, she's, she's a painter, she doesn't do anything but paint. Nikita Shaleni, the Ukrainian artist, he works in large scale installations and watercolors. So we often exhibited actually the, the, the process. So for Paul, I mean, you see here this uh, horrendous little Disney carpet that, you know, is inside the work, but it's also present in, in, the, in the installation. For uh, Yu Hong, she painted. Um, Painted all the uh, um, all the templates that then were wrapped around the piece. So you know we exhibited that, and you know in some some museum installations, of course, with the artworks were exhibited alongside the sculpture and some of the other you know video art and artists. So I think it's it's individual, different every time. And I think the art was very interesting in this crazy uh, media obsessed, selfie obsessed world, Instagram obsessed world. Virtual reality is still a very solitary experience. So when you you can't really talk about it, you can't see it on YouTube so well. You have to put the headset on, you have to move around in that space, and that's the only way you know you can experience it. And every time you put it on, you see something new. So it's very, I mean, today it's still solitary, I'm sure that it's going to change, it already is. But there's something also very, very special about that, something very rare and very unique. Yeah, it's quite performative, and uh, there's, there's also a lot of, I, I think most of the interesting work is being made by theater companies in VR because it's like that's a culture really of thinking about the human body and how you like inviting it in. So there's like lots of things also in that field that, that's being done. It stages differently. Like being like in a tight stage. I mean I think because it's an immersive immersive experience or just an experience in the broadest sense, it has this kind of kind of tendency towards being narrated afterwards. Like you have to it's it, it's very hard to it's impossible actually to, to document or directly, even indirectly document an experience, an immersive experience. So what you do is you start telling a story. And I think this adds a kind of social dimension to uh, VR, or uh, uh, I think in a strong sense to VR than AR, but I'm not sure, uh, which I think is easily overlooked. I don't know how you think about it. Like, how do people interact with uh, the other artists, collectors, uh, um, when they talk about the, uh, uh, the pieces you, you, you make or you, you produce or you uh, present and uh, sell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, that's, that's really one of the more interesting dimensions of it. It's like, if it's made well, people take off headset and they're kind of shaking or they want to talk to someone about it, they want to like deliver the narrative to someone else. Um, and I think that's also interesting actually at film festivals because often they have a they have a bar or they have a social point and then many different experiences and people queue up. So like imagine an art fair, it's kind of like an art fair, but every installation is VR. It's like the film world has been doing that for a while. And then like in between the pieces, people there are points made for them to go and 
converse about the experience before they enter another one. So that's like a really interesting dynamic format, and it's traveling. It's like festivals also travel around. You know, it's it's like New York's mobile. You can do all these dynamic things. Um, but I think that's that's one of the reasons that it keeps being of interest to me at least is like the conversation and the physicality for, for, for people's bodies. I think that goes in the direction of what we also notice at the gallery. Somehow we have the most fun openings where we show we are in a certain way. It's very, it's very social. So at least they're, they're, they're not any worse than others. And it's not that people only stay for five minutes and for going in, in there themselves. They just stay and they share their experiences and they look at it, they comment. They, it's, 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 um, it's very nice. And of course the artists, if they want to talk to each other about their work, I mean, most of them who are working with virtual reality are technically well equipped, so I mean, they can exchange files. Or somehow they invite each other to their studio to look at the files. And I think this change is very interesting, it changed a lot, because I remember when we first exhibited Paul's work in Venice in uh, 2017, and uh, Christian Lemon's work. People were almost terrified, they saw the headset lying on the floor, and they thought, oh shit, I can't go there, I can't touch it. So you really had to encourage them to put it on. I mean, especially people who are not uh, you know, prone to, to see you know, the technology. Whereas now, you really feel, and we also saw this with the lines, people people know what they're doing and they start to, this bodily movement, which I think is fascinating, and I always feel like, you know, if one could film them, how people really get into it and they stay in there. So it's, it's I think it's already changing so much, our perception of it. And what I notice is a very, very interesting uh, thing, which I think is why we are still in VR and we believe in it. Everybody, under 12, although we don't, <laughs> unfortunately, cannot let them see the piece. They beeline when they see the headsets. They beeline at the at the stand or in the museum. They're the same, you know. They they immediately go for it. And there is this this um, craving for the younger generation to to see art through that lens. It already starts for the younger generation with screens. Whenever I show like screen-based work at an art fair, I have all the youngsters standing there looking at it, loving Olia Lialina, which is kind of rather dry for a kid, I would say, in that art. And then you have the parents coming, looking at it, oh my god, what is this? I love it, I love it, I want to stay, no, no, we are leaving, it's very funny. <laughs> would you say there's a special audience uh, buying uh, virtual uh, reality art uh, or augmented reality art? Is there a, a new, new type of collector, to put it in a different way? Well, I think, for, firstly, I wouldn't call it yet an audience. I think it's such a new, I wouldn't even call it a market. I think it's such a, just such a new area for people to explore. And I think we, for example, have been focusing mostly on institutions, showing our pieces institutions and foundations, you know, at uh, festivals, um, in order for people to familiarize themselves with what it is like. Although it's actually quite easy, and of course, you know, you know the, works, the works are for sale through the galleries that represent the artists, and it's actually quite easy to have a piece of VR in your in your home, you know, in a three square meter space, um, and you know there is the, there is a very slow tendency to start buying these pieces. But I mean, there are already collectors that want to collect VR that have been collecting uh, new media, and I think museums and institutions are going to be or are already the first ones that are going to make this change. And there are a few institutions that are already thinking of building virtual reality rooms. Their spaces. I mean, for example, there was one at uh, Anita Zabudovich's space in London where we showed our piece. So she already has a VR room specifically built for that purpose. Yeah, um, so I have, I'm like, I've been fortunate to have some collectors for the work, and they are all institutions. It's all like they're really interested in also like how do you archive it, all, all these questions of like building new practices for collecting digital art. And what I technically sell is like a a contract that gives you the right to stage the work. So that goes back to this installation that I think is really essential because it's like, if you are a, a, an institution that has a big physical space, why only have like this little headset in it? It's sort of like, when you can you know, stage it for a lot of audience, you can't do that. So that's technically how I like, actually sell the work, is that it's a contract that allows them to stage it, to show it, and then there are, you know, there are editions of it. Um, and um, 
yeah, for me that has been that's been making sense. Yeah, I must say I also believe in this kind of shared ownership that you could also or, or call it somehow the, the work and think virtual reality works. But well, we experience often after starts working on them, then they are constantly being upgraded or even being extended. And even if they would stay the same one point in time, the HTC Vive might not work, the Oculus might not work anymore. So buying them in the first place and putting them maybe in your living room might be fun for a couple of months if you have items and right equipment. But then after a couple of months or a year or two, the problems might start and I think you really need a collector or somebody who buys it who's interested in working with an artist. Like It's a bit like, a, like yeah, entering a marriage somehow for this bonus work. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely feel a conflict in terms of how it's produced in the market. It's like, I create editions, but then I'm so, I have a piece now that, because uh, I'm making an AR work now, so that's the phone, so I've become familiar with it. With the tech of it and how you like optimize and run for it, so now I have an old VR work that I would actually like to make possible for people to download and experience like a first-person game almost on their phones. But I kind of I don't like I don't can't really do it because there are only these false editions that have been sold, all been sold to collections. So it's like, but it, it's also the only field right now in VR that allows me to create this work. It's the hard work. It's like if I go to an agency, they will not grant me that kind of freedom. So it's also like the, the, the market for buying like installations and things allows for this type of production to exist as well. But it also, there are some cultures in it that also limit some of these things of letting a piece just continue to evolve, which is quite natural for all the digital production. You update it, you change it, you can do whatever you want. You can have many more forms of one, one thing to become many things. I mean, also on the other hand, you can build up that, that's also the another possibility is that it ages. I mean, I mean, look at the works that were produced two, three years ago, and they still, they still hold. And I think this is when you really feel the artist's input, and then you, you know, you really can feel that you know this is unmistakably this artist and that artist. So it's a bit like video art, when it was, you know, when it was in its nascent stages in the seventies. You still, of course, you we are you updated. You have to make it um, possible to view it with new technology. But I think it's also it's kind of part of VR art history. In a sense, so you know, it'll be interesting to see pieces that are produced now in 10 or 15 years' time. You know how they age. I think there's also it's very, it's very interesting to keep that as it is. Yeah, I always I have some artists who are really like continuously working on one piece for two or three years, and they somehow it seems they will never stop. And sometimes I feel could you please move on maybe to a new work? I mean, this is wonderful for now. Maybe we leave it as is. But I get your point with saying that you would now make it, would want to make it available in another technology or another platform. But there I feel, I mean, Warhol also did, did like one original and then he had so many like prints or whatever of these things. So maybe that's also a discussion one should go for with, with collectors. I mean, it might yeah. even help them. The more people that see it, that see it the more appreciated it might be. And somehow, I mean, they have this one edition that they can sell. But uh, anybody else can also have fun with it. I mean, it's like buying a website. You own it, you, you're the owner of this URL, but at the same time, everybody can look at it in an ideal case, at least. And do you think we'll soon experience a uh, uh, kind of art fair um, in VR? In VR or for VR? In VR. When you look at our gallery, that's somehow what we tried to do. We took individual works and put them in a, in a space. You could say an art fair is like a similar space to our five, five room gallery. But if you look at the work and, and the amount of work that went into putting each of the works in the rooms, then I would say for an art fair that lasts for five days, where you have to integrate 100 galleries, it's not really very realistic, I think. But if it could stay for longer and maybe more people would join in and kind of take care of their own rooms, maybe like more like permanent showrooms, why not? Yeah, actually, that's really interesting. There was like a continuous online art fair, and people had their spaces, and they, they would just have to hire their own developers and so on yes. to do it. But you could go there and visit it. I mean, the technology is already available. There's there's an, an online platform where all you need to do is to like build your scene and then you can upload it on the server, even on Dropbox or something, and send the link, and then people can jump right in. Um, like, I, I would like to do that for studio visits at some point. 
curators and VIs it's at home, I could make like a little, my own little um, space like that. But I mean, yeah, that, that, that would be really cool. You don't need me anymore. <laughs> I think you already, always, uh, it's always many people together. I mean, I even think about curators that when I do new pieces as collaborators, it's like, it's, I look at making VR art as the language that I know from outside the art world in like commercial 3D productions. That's the, the method I apply as well, where everybody a part of the project. So, and it's, yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Three of us are exclusively in the art world, so we're very, <laughs> not very, very understanding of technology. We're learning all the time. And our other uh, two partners actually have a company called Quora VR in uh, Denmark, who produce, uh, who do VR for not for gaming. And this actually was the reason why we wanted to work with them. They work with uh, with healthcare. They work with big uh, projects in, in, in Denmark and Scandinavia. So they're really sort of on the forefront front of uh, VR technology. Um, and you know, our idea was just to focus with core contemporary and producing artworks with contemporary artists. So no experiences, no kind of virtual museums, no um, you know, no entertainment. So really just working with the artists and producing artworks. And if you, if I go back to your question about the economic model, um, so you know we invest or produce the works, and the galleries that represent the artists sell them. So you know, for example, a limited housing work in Sevilla Hopkins represent Paul. Uh, you know, I'm tasked with, uh, with selling the artwork, and then you know our sh most of the share goes to the artists, and our share goes back into producing new artworks. So it's kind of a self-sustaining system. So we can continue to, to approach artists or to allow artists to approach us. And of course, as we were talking earlier, you know, at the moment the additions, smaller editions of, of artworks, a bit like on video art, but we hope that in the future you know, it will be more accessible and much more you know, broad, broadly available to the public. Yeah, I think it would be awesome if there was also like a, if, if some institutions also start to have like a big VR digital platform or something, so that that, that's kind of a structure for artists to work on, to be invited in as well. Like, that's something I, I also hope someone will make. Well, new museums that had the uh, incubator where they were allowed to do some things. You know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, also, um, like, what if, the, what, if, what if there was a contemporary art VR platform as well that was like really widely uh, used? Or kind of known, not just in art world, but like also beyond, in, next to all the other VR. Because I think all of this stuff in the future is going to be more and more seen next to what people are doing on the kids. I think more and more, if the, the difference is if you go to the art world or the museum or an experience space or a concert or an immersive experience in a festival, those those bonus, I, I just, that's just my hypothesis, by is going to dissolve. Because at least from what I know, from people who make it, that's happening. So if people who make it, those are dissolving, that's, that's probably what I think is gonna happen. It's like all the concerts that are, like I said, we're doing this piece in a music festival, but it's like the music festival is doing more and more immersive experiences because that's where the audience is leading towards. So if you think from an audience perspective, they are looking for you know immersive experiences. And if it's in a museum or not, I think that's gonna sort of um, change the so I, I don't know. How expensive is it to do an artwork like uh, the 
one you showed in Point Academy, for example? Uh, from Spencer. Um, the artworks we produce cost between, again, it's the hours. Let's say it costs between 30 and 100,000. Uh, and with the prices range again, and this is not, it's not, you know, the, the idea for us also was not that the price of the artwork should be um, relative to how many hours we spend on it. It was, you know, an artwork can be very, very simple, but it can be more expensive. But the prices are, yes, again, ranging the same between 10,000 and 100,000. And did I understand it right that you are paid, you are producing it so you pay the production and then? The gallery say, sells it, and you get back the production costs plus something. Or what? yes, at the moment we've been producing all the artworks. The core contemporaries and financing the production, but we are, you know, we're working to collaborate with uh, with also commissions and institutions and galleries. But uh, yes, so the gallery would sell it, and the the, 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 the profits are the sales are split between three parties. But the artist being the most the one who gains the most. And who chooses? I mean, who of you chooses with whom you do something like this? Well, we had certain dreams, and you know, we still have a list of artists that we dream to work with. Um, so, you know, Paul was one of them, Tony Asler also another, and New Mom. And then we will also want in the future to enable more uh, emerging artists who do not work in VR to, to, to produce with us. So at the moment, We've been lucky enough to be able to approach the artists. And some of them agree, some of them don't, some of them are not ready. Um, so yes, it's, it's sort of an organic process. We sit together and dream. And why are you so interested in artists who usually don't work with VR, but come from different fields and then try to produce something new in VR and not try to, um, let's say, teach artists, emerging artists, how to um, work with VR, not produce something in VR? Well, I think for, for us it was interesting to see VR as a completely new medium, as the new avant-garde. So for the artists who, to give them an opportunity to explore the completely new medium. And having said that, for example, we just did a workshop for uh, artists who work mostly in the photography medium in the Photographer's Gallery in London, where we gave them an insight of how to produce works in VR. So then hopefully then we can, you know, it was almost like a teaching workshop and give them a better understanding whether they want to do that as a medium, whether they do it with us or with somebody else along the road. So it's a process. I think, as I said, it's only been you know, two and a half years. I think we're all exploring various different possibilities. For example, Amiri, I really admire somehow the work that you do with artists who really come from, the, let's say, visual art, not of the digital art. And um, we created this gallery building explicitly for works that come out of the digital realm because we felt that they need a platform, that we need a platform for experimentation with virtual building for virtual or digital art. But I would love to invite um, artists who are not familiar with this media to see what they would actually do if they are kind of being exposed or getting access, getting the opportunity of working in VR. I mean, for example, can you imagine a Sarah Morris or a Katharina Grosse they get somehow anyway, they're anyway getting beyond their canvas already, but if they could go totally free or crazy, it could be so fantastic. I mean, so far, I didn't get them, but uh, <laughs> well, that's what keeps us going. This is how the idea of Gorgon Temporary came, actually, from Christian Lemons. Two years before we found it, he said, oh my goodness, there's this VR world, and if there was anything I would like to try, it would be that. So, I mean, the, the enthusiasm and the excitement of the artists is what keeps us going. And when you see them, wanted to do more and more and more, and they, each artist we've worked with, they want to do more, they want more of this media, which is really exciting. I think it's also great kind of to help VR, even though all these connections to the game world, to the film world, they're very necessary and good in certain ways, but it, I think, especially in the art context, it is also good if the media starts being used really like an artistic media, and, and there's a lot that can be done still, I think get a bit like out of this game-like feeling which is also related to the way a lot of these works are being programmed today. So I really appreciate also artists like, for example, Swan Collective, or the two artists that you have, that really come from painting and then put their paintings as a, as a background or canvas in their virtual reality and creates a completely different atmosphere. I have a question um, about platform. 
because you mentioned the platform and the possibility to uh, to show um, your work in different platforms, your idea of the museum. I mean, the, the platform exists, right? They are multiplying. You have uh, your platform in a, uh, a hacky show, it's about work with virtual reality. In the exhibition, we have the mouse in the collection. There are many other platforms. Radiance, for example, comes to my mind, it's really dedicated to virtual reality. But I was wondering, as an artist, and maybe also you as a gallerist or as a producer, um, have you thought about using platform like Steam, which is a huge platform um, with a, such a big success uh, uh, of users? It's a platform for video games, but they also have, uh, of course, a world of virtual reality. How about infiltrating platforms that are not specifically created within a cultural context, like uh, contemporary art, but infiltrating those platforms that already exist to, uh, to further distribute your work as work of art? Would that be interesting? Would that be denaturating? Would that be something um, uh, incoherent from an artistic point of view? Uh, the chances, of course, to touch, to touch much a wider audience, so it could be exciting as well. So what's your thought about it? Yeah, I have a piece on Steam and on Vive, and uh, yeah, the, we have about 45,000 downloads on them, so it's quite a nice number, but I, for me, what I think too is like, I mean, a lot of artists I hang out with, they have their games on Steam and so on. And what I would think is that there's a game I might make. So it's like, as an artist, I would want to make something that really works well and is made specific for that platform um, and emphasize it stronger. So it's like, when I make it for a museum, I'm trying to make it work really well in a museum. But it's, it's also complicated to do both because you might just, no one downloads because no one knows about it beyond the people who already go to the museum. Because that's like a massive attention battle online, which is pretty insane. Um, but yeah, I mean, I see, or actually, something that I've been thinking about is there's a project I'm working on, and an extension of that, I'm talking to the museum of can we produce something that's made specifically, maybe not Steam, but maybe for your phone or an app store or something. That's that's a, an inherent piece as part of the show, but for that platform. I think that's really interesting, so that you produce it with the museum the institution, and the institution embraces that platform too. And if you're like kind of from the art world, I mean, it, there are many. It's just like it gets really complicated. Also, like how do you how do you ask for these regional new people and scheme? You don't show on the front page unless you pay like two hundred thousand dollars in branding, that, and that's just the minimum. And then you then you have against five million dollars in branding production for for a hundred million dollar game. It's like. But then once it catches on fire, then it can just go completely viral online too. So if you start the right community, maybe if you do that, that's happened to some friends. Uh, but these are all the practices of uh, navigating an online download space, which is also just as complicated as, as Opera and Opera and everything. It's just, uh, I find I found my, found my own personal niche a little bit comfortable in the, in the museum right now. But uh, I, I think there are really interesting new possibilities of practicing outside that too, but without, for example, having to get funding from a brand or an agency to produce it, because, yeah, like I say, it's really expensive to produce as well. I think what's also interesting is the reverse. Sometimes, I mean, what we found, and I think what might happen, is that the museum becomes a platform for people who are not in the art world. Mm. Because VR is something which attracts, of course, the, you know, the younger generation, generally crowds, maybe people who are only gaming, and when they hear about VR, they come and see the show, I and mean, we've experienced that with Leonard's and McCarthy in Leipzig. So where people who never encountered, never really went to museum shows, they went because of the VR, they saw the work, then they went and bought, bought the book about the artist. And they never, they never, they never actually went to a museum show per se. So it's it's cool because it's a reverse, and I feel that museums can become platforms for you know people interested, not interested enough, and maybe vice versa. So I think it works both ways. Yeah, and I, I have a lot of conversation with people too who work on the other side of really commercial productions, and everybody are, are discussing in VR how to survive. It's like everybody in the in the commercial industry too, how do we even survive? It's like it's been going down for that, and then a little love again. But um, the, yeah, the, and location-based entertainment is the concept that is really working well in the states at least. So it's emphasizing physical location and bringing people in. That is the model that like. A lot of studios have a successful financial gain in, and then a few, because gaming is like, or like the full online model is more volatile than the art world is like. 1% of them 
might like 50 times make the budget they spent, and then 99 or like nothing. It's like brutal online. Um, but yeah, so like I actually did an interview on that together with a funding platform called Kaleidoscope that's been researching and building out uh, systems for financing VR. And that, to them I introduced the concept of limited edition. And it like, was so interesting to them that you could sell X amount of installations to like Las Vegas and to uh, cinemas and things that they could do that. And they're like, oh, you can do that? Or that was like really new to them. So that, that was a practice that's been going on since we talked in our world. So yeah, location. It's, it's actually really successful to put me out in the physical space. Speaking of location, is it, are there any regional scenes or communities of VR artists? I mean, yes. It's, so Nina probably knows a lot of artists that I also know who are in Europe that I like, rarely see. But I have a whole scene in the States and in New York that's like, a really strong community. Um, yeah, there are a community in like, Berlin, London, there are, people kind of know each other internationally, but they're definitely still regionalized again because it, you need you still need physical mediums, you still need physical space, you need like um, workshops. People do all sorts of interesting like meetings and things where people just show them each other and then it's different. Um, but that, that's like fun that there are definitely regional scenes for sure. I have a question about uh, editions. And the edition normally in computer games is the pre-order bonus or the add-on. Will you use uh, such modalities or do you just or use the normal modalities of edition of like 20 or something like that? I mean, uh, you get a super reflective custom book. <laughs> We, we use editions just like as in the video, so 5 yeah. plus 2 APs, 20 plus 2 APs, yeah, so classic. I do the same. <laughs> yeah, it's also the way we work, but we also have a lot of artists who I think we do that too, who create a special computer or a special installation that somehow comes with the VR piece. That's then like one installation, including this virtual reality piece and maybe also some video pieces that might change it a little what you're actually getting or buying that might then be unique in its composition again. I mean, I also, the, the, the finance of it also comes down to how art institutions work, because it's like, if you're big institutions and you have, you know, 100,000 people going through a show, I think you should be able to pay an adequate proportion of that to production of a professional level that you pay in other fields where people are having that kind of audience engagement. That's like, that's um, that's where I see the future is for institutions to like work or operate as other fields that have physical people coming in and experiencing something. Um, Starts at 7 p.m.